want to welcome you to our Sunday morning pre-service worship as we just gather for a time to come before the Lord and to remember who he is and to just get to worship him. So I want to invite you to come with us now and to sing and to just settle your heart this morning as we turn to our God and we think about who he is and we talk to him this morning.
Yes, I am a child of God. Father, we just thank you that we don't have to be slaves to fear. But you call us to be your children and to come into your presence and to honor you and to worship you. And so we come here this morning to give you the glory and to give you all blessing. Lord, because we believe that you are worthy and deserving of our praise and our adoration. And so, Jesus, we just remember that you are a God who is in control this morning. That you are a God who has called us to be your people and to follow you. Jesus, I thank you for your perfect love that casts out all fear, that we get to come before you in boldness and confidence, knowing that you are our God, Lord, that we are your children, and that you love us. And so we just thank you this morning for your presence and the ways that you are working in our lives. We love you. We thank you for being here. We pray this in your beautiful name. Amen.
upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children
be gracious to you. The Lord turned his, his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. Good morning. We want to invite you to join us this morning as we begin our worship service, as we come before the Lord and we turn to him and we remember who he is and that we are called to be a people who walks in his ways and follows his words. We want to know the words that he speaks. And so this morning as we begin with our worship song, I just invite you to feel free to stand wherever you are, to sing along, to remember that you are singing before the Lord alone. And so you can close your eyes if you would like, you can spread out, but we invite you to join with us as we begin worshiping our God and our Savior.
Well, good morning, and we are so glad that you're here to join us, and uh, Sunday mornings are a wonderful time that we remind ourselves of who God is, and we remind ourselves of his love and his grace and his mission in the world, and we just know that these times are difficult for many of you. There are uh, just various ways that you are suffering and rolling with things. Uh, some, of, some of us just have that deep, dull ache of just wanting to be together, too, and, and, uh, and it's important that we all reflect on the fact that even in this moment, we are expressing worship to God by honoring those most vulnerable among us, the least of these. And so that, too, is an act of worship as we gather this morning. And as Romans 12.1 says, that, that we offer a living sacrifice, and that's what we're doing in these times. It's also a wonderful time for us to reflect upon the early church who worshiped in their homes and then went out to their neighborhoods. It was beyond the walls of a church building, and they worshiped and did the mission of God in their neighborhoods. So we rejoice in that today, and we hope that today reminds and inspires you with what God is speaking and who he is in our world. A few things as we gather together. Uh, first off, the Love Your Neighbor project continues. Um, we have just some recent donations that have just put this in a good spot especially. And so if you have any needs for this project, we want to welcome that. Uh, this is a great opportunity. We want to encourage you to be reaching out to your neighbor, offering those uh, means of encouragement in this time that might speak to others or that might just lift somebody else up, just expressing love to them. Um, if you have a project, maybe you don't have the funds to do it, we want to support that. If you need a couple, a little extra funds that could expand out what your idea is, we want to support that too. And so uh, please uh, consider this Love Your Neighbor project in a good way. And I know my family and I engaged it uh, this past week, and we support a local business and went around to our neighbors, and we just got to know them a little bit more. And it was just some great conversations, some even ones that were richer than any we've had before. So we just encourage you, be out there. Uh, support your neighbor and, and love them. We're going to have a summer book club this year too. And one of the most challenging questions of our times is what does it mean to follow Jesus in our modern times? And so we are going to be reading a book together that explores that and just having some conversation and see what conversations come up out of that. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can check that out online. Um, sign up through the e-news or just send an uh, email to the office on that and we will get you connected. Also, if there is any issue with uh, funding, if you can't afford the book right now, we will uh, provide that so we can talk about that. So please, just let us know. We want to make sure if you want to be a part of it, you can. In a couple weeks, we are going to be starting a two-week series on Refresh Your Life, Learning from COVID-19 Times. Uh, we are all in a unique season of life right now where we've all had some time to reflect and that in God's providence and sovereignty, he's been speaking to us and that he's working something good in the midst of these challenges and these difficulties. This uh, series is going to be an opportunity for a couple weeks just to reflect on what he has spoken to us and what might he be inviting you into for new ways in your life in this time. So we'll have a resource along with that and some other things, and there'll be more to come on that. But join us for that in a couple weeks to refresh your life. And finally, today is Memorial Day. And so as a part of that, we just remember and we give thanks to those who have served in the military and those who have given of their lives in that. And uh, we are thankful for their sacrifice. And scriptures tell us no greater love is there than this, 
that one lays down their life for their friends. And so we remember those sacrifices today and even remember them as we continue to sacrifice our lives as we go out into the world as followers of Jesus too. And whatever your sacrifice is, we hope that you live into that. But we thank you, uh, those who have served and the families that are, are remembering those people. Uh, let's take the opportunity now, though, and let's turn our hearts to God in prayer. Father, we gather today by your Holy Spirit to remember our hope that is not in this world, but a hope revealed through your Son, Jesus. We have been experiencing that all the things of this life are temporary, whether it's our health or even the opportunity to connect, and we have been humbled, O oh Lord. But we are reminded there is a Savior and a King under who all things will be as they were meant to be. There is a coming kingdom. And so we take comfort that this hope cannot be removed or taken from us, but is found in you, that the joy of the Lord is our strength, as we just sang. We thank you for those who have given their lives in service to others for this country. Many had their lives cut short for that. And so comfort the families who this weekend is one of grief, perhaps even a fresh grief. And help us to be willing to die for the things you call us, Lord, to be willing to sacrifice for the things you would invite us, that we would take up our crosses. In that way too, Lord, we come to you on behalf of our world. And there are many trials of this time from COVID-19 and its health effects, as well as the financial ripple outs and so many other things we could name. We lift that to you. For Michigan, as they deal with severe flooding and the implications of that in an already complicated time. For the challenges of injustice in our world, where we lament those who are wronged by others, whether because of race, ethnicity, age, even disabilities, or even just being unborn. We lament all the ways this world is not the way it is supposed to be. Not because it takes away our comfort. These are heavy upon our hearts because they are heavy upon yours. Grant us your heart, O Lord, our God, in all of its ways. We also acknowledge our sin this morning, where we look more at what we want than what others need, where we have put our plans and priorities over a person you may have called us to serve. We confess we have held so much pleasure in our control that this time of our lack of control reminds us of our own limitations and mortality. We confess that as we confess, our minds will go to think of others' wrongs in these things and not our own wrongs. But in this moment, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. Help us to live with you as the source of our life, that it would not be ourselves, not our circumstances, not others, but that you would be the source of all life and all hope. And we gather today under your firm, strong, and gracious hands, knowing that you go before us and you go with us. You are already in the future that is going to be. And we take comfort that you see all things. Nothing escapes your sight. And so we also want to come with some prayer requests as well. And friends, I just invite you to respond as you might feel uh, silently in your hearts on these various prayer buds. One thing I pray for the sick, isolated, or those suffering. One thing I thank you for today is. One thing I pray for the kiddos, youth, and university students as they complete studies is. One thing I pray for business and government leaders in these complicated days is. One thing I pray for my blessed person or someone in my life who needs more of Jesus is. And I pause to think of one of my neighbors next door. One prayer I lift for them is. Father, we remember you are with us and we remember your love for the world and all who are in it. Help us to be your church to your glory and our neighbor's good in this time. 
And we close reminding ourselves of how we began this prayer. We celebrate and we remind ourselves we have come to worship the King, all glorious above, to gratefully sing of his wonderful love. All glory and honor be to his name.
As we move into our next song, we'll be moving into our time of offering. So we want to invite you to click on the link that is in the description box. That will take you to our online giving. And we invite you just in this season that as we are trusting the Lord in so many ways, that one of the ways we also get to trust him is the ways that he provides for all that we need. Because we believe that the Lord knows each need that we have in our life, each want that needs to be met, I think that we, we see in scripture that the Lord is faithful to his people. He is faithful to his children. And so we just invite you to, if this is a harder season for you, that you would be able to turn to the Lord, that you would trust him in the work that he is doing and the ways that he is providing and the ways that he is working. But we also want to invite you to sow into First Covenant Church and the ways that the Lord is using his church to be his hands and feet here on the earth, to be the light for his kingdom. And we invite you to just want to keep the love your neighbor project before you that if there are ways that you want to serve and reach out to those around you but don't have the resources we want to invite you to contact us because we want to come alongside you and we want to come alongside the community and as his people we want to be those who are willing to go out and to serve and to do all that he has called us to do because we believe that he's worthy of being known by each and every person that is on the earth and so as we go into our next song, I just invite you to, to just be able to come before the Lord, to bring your heart to him, to talk to him and reflect on this season and what he's been doing and the things that he has been teaching you and the ways that he has been at work. Because we know that we serve a God who moves in great power, who is still able to work miracles and is still worthy and is still deserving of our love and our adoration. And so I just invite you to think about the things the Lord has been teaching you in this season and what he still wants to teach you, the ways he wants to show you his love and show you his provision. And so we can be his people who declare that he is worthy and he is deserving of all glory. It's 
who is like you, that truly, truly there is no one who can compare to your glory and to your might, Lord. And so we just come and we thank you for your love. Lord, we know that we were unworthy of being loved, of being saved. And yet while we were still sinners, you died for us and you've offered us life. And so we thank you for that this morning and we come to praise you today and to remember all that you've given us, that you've saved us from death that you've saved us from an eternity of being separated from you. But Lord, that you call us to follow you and that we will get to spend all of eternity with you in your presence, that we will know you more and more each day. So Lord, we just thank you for that gift. We ask that you would help us to walk in ways that are worthy of being your children, of ways that proclaim the truth of who we know you to be, that show the world that truly God, you alone are the Lord and you alone are good. We love you, we thank you for who you are, and we pray this in your beautiful name, amen. Good morning, church. In the New Testament letters, especially the New Testament letters written by the Apostle Paul, we find many different passages which speak to life as a disciple of Jesus, what it means to follow as a Christian disciple. 
One of those passages that spells out in very practical terms some of the implications of what it means to be a Christ follower come to us from Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. I'd like to read beginning in chapter 4 with verse 25 and continuing on through verse 2 of chapter 5 in this Ephesian letter. Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we all are all members of one body. In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgives you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children who live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Before this pandemic called COVID-19 came into our lives, we used to be able to go into bookstores and browse through those various sections and find something that would be appealing and, and helpful to our lives as we chose something to entertain us, to educate us, to bring us a new insight that we were looking to gain. Sections like fiction or non nonfiction or devotional helps or self-help books of various kinds, all of those were available as we would browse through, pick up books, look through them briefly, and then decide whether it was worth our purchase. Now we're limited to places like Amazon, where we order that book, and we base our decision on the brief description that is given on that online account. And we never actually hold that book in our hands and look through it until it arrives on our doorstep a few days after we have ordered it. A few years ago, an author by the name of Malcolm Gladwell wrote a very helpful book entitled Outliers. In that book, he basically tries to determine what factors are necessary to make a person successful in life. Is it a person's natural intelligence that determines success? Is it the family into which that person has been born that determines success? Is it because there are some people among us who are born with extraordinary natural athletic abilities that go far beyond the natural average person. Certainly all of those factors play a role in helping de to determine whether or not a person is going to succeed in whatever endeavor it is that he or she is attempting. But as significant as all of those factors are, Gladwell's basic conclusion when all of those other factors are factored in, is that there are really two key elements that determine whether or not a person is going to achieve success. Those two factors, according to Gladwell at least, are potential and practice. I'm sure you're all aware that this summer was supposed to be the competition that rolls around every four years called the Olympic Games. They were scheduled to happen in Tokyo and because of our COVID-19 realities, that experience has been postponed at least for a year to 2021. 
before those games can be held. Maybe it's because those games are not going to be happening this summer that I have found myself thinking about various athletic competitions from previous Olympics. Many of you perhaps recognize the name of Gabby Douglas. She was one of our American gymnastic team that represented the United States both in 2012 and in 2016. In fact, in the 2012 games, Gabby Douglas won the all-around gold medal, recognizing her as the top gymnast in the world who was competing in that particular Olympic competition. If you were to Google the name of Gabby Douglas, you would find, among other things, that she has written a book that describes her life leading up to and continuing through those 2012 Olympic Games. The story of her life describes how, as a young girl, she was recognized as having extraordinary natural ability in the gym. She achieved everything that you could imagine that a young gymnast could achieve, but knew that there was more potential that she was never going to realize unless she got different coaching. And so she and her family made the decision that Gabby would move hundreds of miles from her home and would move to train under a gymnastic trainer who lived in a different state in order to maximize the po potential that she could in no other way be achieving. She felt that by making that sacrifice, she could be nurtured to the full potential of her natural ability. Now it's obvious that people like Gabby Douglas have athletic ability that far surpasses probably all of us. But underlying all of that great potential that she had as an athlete was the underlying reality that she dedicated herself to spending literally thousands of hours in the gym practicing the various skills that were necessary to compete at an Olympic level. In order to become a two-time Olympic gold medalist, Gabby Douglas needed both talent and practice. The verses that we've read this morning from Paul to the Ephesian church give us some of the basic ingredients that Paul felt were necessary to convey how those young disciples of Jesus were to practice their faith. He lists some of the ingredients that were necessary for those early Christians and for us as well as 21st century Christians to put into practice in our lives if we are going to be successful, so to speak, in our discipleship. One of the truths that many of Paul's letters make clear is that if we practice our faith in isolation from others, we are missing a vital ingredient. Our life as disciples of Jesus is connected in integral ways with one another as brothers and sisters in the faith. We cannot successfully live in isolation from one another as followers of Jesus. We're part of a community of faith, just as we're those early Christians living in Ephesus. Paul expresses that truth in a variety of ways. Among them is, is a phrase and a, a teaching found in verse 25, which says this, we are all members of one body. Some translations put it into these words. We are all members of one another. The, the basic truth is obvious that we need the strength and the encouragement that comes from living in fellowship and in connection with one another as followers of Jesus. When we practice our faith and try to live out the teachings 
of the New Testament in our daily lives, that process becomes easier for us when we recognize that we can rely on the body, that we can depend upon one another as brothers and sisters in the faith, that our strength, our effectiveness, our commitment to living for Jesus is enhanced by doing this in a corporate sense in which we lean upon and rely upon each other. No doubt there are some athletes who work out and practice their sport completely on their own, isolated from everyone else, even from coaches. But that simply doesn't work well in our Christian living. Practicing our faith is intended to be a shared experience. One of the responsibilities that older, more mature Christians are to experience is to model the life of what Christ-like discipleship looks like so that younger believers can observe from us what it means to follow Jesus in an effective way. As you think of your church family, or maybe others who are close to you, are there specific individuals that you can think of who have modeled Christ-like discipleship for you? Are there people who have influenced your life to such a degree that you can say, those are the people that I want to emulate. Those are the people that show me clearly what it looks like to follow Jesus. Who are the fellow believers who have had the greatest impact in your spiritual journey? And maybe an even more important question is this. Who might be looking to you, hoping to see a Christ-like example of what Christian living looks like. I realize that this communal aspect of following Jesus is really tough for us to apply right now because we are not physically together as we would so much wish we were. Because of the pandemic that continues to spread, the reality is that even though we need one another, we can't touch, we can't hug, we can't embrace that fellow brother or sister in Christ as we would so much wish we could do. But even though that is our present reality, there are still ways in which we can connect to those with whom we live and serve Jesus together. It's important that we reach out to one another, perhaps particularly in these difficult times, that we stay in touch, that we make a phone call, that we text, that we even put a stamp on a letter and send a, a note of encouragement to those among us who are perhaps so isolated and alone. Even though we are not physically together, that does not prohibit us from being spiritually connected. And that is what is so vitally important, particularly in a time such as this. It's not hard for us to recognize the discipline and the practice that is necessary for a person to become an accomplished athlete or a, a skilled musician or, or someone who wants to develop any number of other specific skills. But what role does practice have in the life of the Christian, of the person who sincerely desires to follow Jesus in an effective, practical way? Just as countless hours of practice are necessary for gifted athletes to reach the level of being able to compete in a sporting event such as the Olympics, so too do we who follow Jesus need the discipline of practicing our faith day after day and year after year. The one quality that makes the difference, according to that author Gladwell, between potential and success is that vital ingredient called practice. 
Have you ever heard of the 10,000 hour rule? Experts have studied hundreds of accomplished athletes and musicians and artists and others who have excelled at their craft, whatever it might be in their specific situations. They have found that any particular discipline of, of life in, as it's lived out in, in those and other ways requires something like 10,000 hours of practice to achieve to their maximum potential. It took Mozart 20 years of composing music before he successfully produced his greatest works of music. It took the chess player Bobby Fischer 10 years of constant practice before he achieved the status of a chess grandmaster. A fellow you may have heard of named Bill Gates programmed computers virtually nonstop for seven years during high school and college years before he got the idea of beginning a little company called Microsoft. I think you get the idea. If we are going to fulfill our potential, our God-given potential as disciples of Jesus, we need to practice our faith day after day. It is not going to simply happen without the discipline of practice. So what are the, some of the specific things that Paul tells us that we are to practice as we seek to follow as his disciples? There are no shortage of Christ-like traits that we could work on, according to the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> At the very top of the list in the passage that we've read this morning from Ephesians, Paul says that we are to practice telling the truth to each other. The NIV puts that phrase a little bit more formally than that, but that's essentially the meaning of what Paul is teaching. A little previous to what we have read this morning, earlier in chapter 4, Paul talks about speaking the truth to one another in love. Practice is not something that we need simply when we're trying to develop a physical skill or working on developing a helpful habit. It's also something that we need to put into practice if we are going to keep that skill sharp. It's not something that simply we arrive at a certain level and that's it. We don't have to worry about ever practicing again because we've mastered that particular area of achievement. It's an ongoing process that Paul insists is a lifelong journey. Telling the truth to each other, even when that truth hurts a bit, is the glue that helps to hold the body of Christ together. On the other hand, lying, Paul suggests, creates a constant cloud of suspicion among believers. Paul was advising that church of Ephesus to practice telling the truth regularly. And after 10,000 hours or so, we should have a, a more healthy community of believers if we are all engaged in that same practice. Coupled with telling the truth, Paul says that we are to deal honestly with the anger that we sometimes feel. To be perfectly honest, I don't think this is an area of Christian living where very many of us do too well. Anger is something that we tend to suppress. It's something that we bury rather than acknowledge and deal with. Anger is often the byproduct of failing to deal openly and honestly with each other as members of the body of Christ. If we're angry with someone, we don't necessarily have to unload all of that anger by telling that person <clears throat> what, a, what an idiot we think he is because of what they have done 
or to question how that person could possibly have, have been so immature to do whatever it is that they have done and put them down because of our supposed superiority. But Paul does encourage us to sit down with that person so that we can work out whatever the issues are that might separate us, so that we don't let that anger that we carry inside us fester until it becomes resentment and ultimately even hatred. Practice telling the truth to one another, Paul insists, is the right method of dealing with that occasional feeling of, of antagonism that we have toward one another. Paul's next item on his list refers to not stealing from one another. At first glance, that seems so obvious that why would we even need to mention it? Why would it even be of concern? Because obviously we aren't supposed to steal the belongings of others. I think that I could safely say that I know you well enough to realize that you're not likely to go sneaking over to your neighbor's house when they're not home and rummage through their stuff looking for something that might be helpful for you to, to take and to use. But there's more to stealing than just walking off with someone's property so that you can make it your own. Paul insists that stealing ultimately breaks down community. It causes the thief to think only of his own needs and own desires and not anyone else's. When Paul encourages us, encourages us not to steal from one another, he also goes on to add that we are to have something to share with those who are in need. He's reminding us of the same truth that he writes about in other letters where Christians are encouraged to put the needs of others ahead of their own needs. For Paul, this basic teaching about not stealing is wrapped in that, that protective layer of looking toward the needs of others and putting their interests and needs ahead of your own. For Paul, it seems to always come back to living in healthy relationship with others in the community of faith. And that is the foundation of what it means to practice this discipline of putting the needs of others ahead of our own. During these shelter-in-place days, Linda and I have found ourselves watching some of the old TV classics from the 1960s. Shows including Andy Griffith and his friend Barney Fife. One of the things that strikes me about watching those old TV shows from decades ago is how clean the language is of those shows. There aren't any four-letter words used that make the listener uncomfortable with the dialogue that's going on in that particular show. Now compare that mode of communicating from the 60s to what we see on, today, on TV shows of today or movies that we might see. There are some who have suggested that foul language is really no big deal. It's just part of our vocabulary and therefore it shouldn't be offensive to anyone. But Paul disagrees vehemently. In verse 29, Paul says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful in building others up. Practicing the use of our speech. Disciplining what comes out of our mouths is not something that comes easily or naturally to us, but Paul would suggest that it needs to be a lifelong discipline of how we exercise our speech in nurturing and encouraging and building others up. 
The matter of fact is that 10,000 hours isn't going to do it. But that length of time would at least be a good starting point in helping us to make that part of our character as disciples of Jesus, that it becomes an ingrained habit of how we communicate to one another. We are in an election year, as you know, and even though we have mercifully been spared from political ads, at least to a large degree, we all realize that the time is perhaps soon coming when presidential candidates and others are going to fill the airwaves with rhetoric that is a long way from what Paul had in mind when he admonishes the church to not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Regardless of what any particular politician may do, let's make sure that we use our speech in such a way that we enhance the spiritual development of others, that we nurture and encourage and build up one another, even through the speech that we use and the affirmations that we share. Paul's list is a long one in these few verses. We could spend more time this morning than we have looking at Paul's teachings in which he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. But that short teaching of what Paul means by that instruction would simply be practice living for Jesus with such consistency that the Holy Spirit within us assures us that the Lord is being honored by how we live our lives as disciples. When that becomes true of our lives, there isn't going to be any room left for things like bitterness or rage or brawling or slander or malice. Instead, our lives will demonstrate kindness and compassion and a willingness to forgive each other, even in those times when we would just as soon hold on to our grudge for a bit longer. For Paul, the bottom line of all of this comes down to practicing our faith by becoming imitators of God. Isn't that really what each of us desires? Isn't that what we would want to set as a goal of our lives, to live our lives together for Jesus in such a way that we are imitating the very nature of God? It sounds like an insurmountable goal, but according to Paul, it is the goal that is worth our striving for each day as we seek to practice our faith. Some of you may have noticed that I chose a rather familiar phrase for the, the title of this morning's sermon, Practice Makes Perfect. Now, I suppose you could make the argument that that's not really true, at least when it comes to the lives that we live in, in our human flesh. Even that athlete who practices for countless hours over many years will make mistakes when the pressure of competition is on. Just ask any of those hundreds of Olympic athletes who have not earned a gold medal. But perfect means something a bit different for us who are Christ followers. Perfect means that we are closer to arriving at maturity in Christ than we were last year or even last month. We are living our lives in such a way that we are striving toward the goal that lies before us to become complete, fulfilled, mature in our lives as disciples. Putting the discipline of practice into our daily life brings us closer to being the person that Jesus wants us to become. Many years ago, the best 
golfer in the world was a man named Ben Hogan. Hogan was once asked by a reporter after he had won yet another tournament, how is it that under pressure you seem able to hit so many miraculous shots? After thinking for a bit, Hogan said, I guess I'm just lucky. But Mr. Hogan, the reporter pressed, you practice more than any other golfer. To which Hogan replied with a smile, the more I practice, the luckier I seem to get. May we commit our lives to practicing what it means to be followers of Jesus so that the one day when we stand in his presence, the Lord might say to each of us, well done, good and faithful servant. One day all of our practice is going to come to an end. Until then, may our daily practice of becoming Christ-honoring disciples continue. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you are patient with us as we practice those things that are so stretching and so challenging to us. Help us, Lord, even this week to focus perhaps on just one area of life in which we find ourselves weak. May we practice, Lord, those things that lead us toward maturity as disciples of Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to join with us as we sing our closing song.
darkness tremble when all the saints join in one song and all the streams flow as one river to wash away our brokenness. As we conclude this morning, hear these words of benediction. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.